Hi, this is Bob Samuels for another edition of ABM Leaders Group. Um, today is a real special one. Uh, we've, we've teamed up with the marketing ops community. We've got some super sharp marketers with us, and we're going to talk about you know, some cool AI tools and some challenges for our marketing operations. So uh, uh, with, uh, let's go ahead and do some introductions. Um, I'd like to you guys to introduce yourselves, give a little bit of your background about about marketing ops, AI, ABM, um, and and maybe a fun fact that someone wouldn't know about you uh, without you know by looking at just LinkedIn, they would would know like something about chickens and stuff like that. So um, <laughs> something about chickens. And Mike, if you you don't have it, doesn't have to be about chickens. Mike, <laughs> uh, no, I appreciate it, Bob. Well, hey everybody, glad to be here, Bob. Thanks for for pulling us together. Um, this should be interesting. We've got we've got some really smart people here. Uh, I'm not one of them. I'm just sort of a facilitator of, of the group. I'm the CEO and founder of marketingops.com, and uh, it is now officially the home of the MoPros community, which is a community full of marketing operations professionals. And uh, we've got about, I'm looking over here, about 5,600 or so people uh, in the Slack channel hanging out, talking shop every day. And um, it's a good time. So if you're not in the community yet, come hang out with us. It is free to join us in Slack. And uh, we host a great conference each year, too. So if you haven't heard about it, it's called Mops of Palooza. Please come join us, whether it's in person or virtual. We'd love to have you there. But yeah, I'm a uh, fun fact about me. Um, gosh, I don't know. I'm like, I'm really double jointed. Like I can, I can like really like do the like things with the fingers <laughs> and, you know, all the things. So yeah, <laughs> my son does this. My five-year-old comes up and he goes, my friends can't do this. And I was like, I know not a lot of people can. <laughs> <laughs> He's got that superpower. Yeah. <laughs> like, so there you go. That's my fun fact, I guess. I appreciate it. Paul? Hey, uh, Paul Wilson. Um, my background is um, in the whole scope of go-to-market systems. So originally doing CRM consulting in both Salesforce and uh, Dynamics. And got into marketing automation, focused really around marketing technology. I've had the great opportunity to work for Marketo, then Adobe, and then Slack and Salesforce and OneTrust and a lot of great organizations. Um, my This community is, is the most important part of everything that we do. And as we go through the transformation and changes that AI and machine learning are, are bringing to this community, I think it's critical and awesome that we stay a community together and help manage through all the changes that are coming. So I'm really excited to, and very excited to get to, to chat with all the folks here on this uh, panel today. Uh, fun fact, uh, a little known fun fact is uh, I am a classically trained musician and I can conduct an orchestra if you stick me in front of it, so. Oh, that's very cool, very cool. <sighs> I didn't know that, that's awesome. Live music oh, from Paul and you Mops of yeah, we're, we're Orchestrating have have... your marketing technology yes. for 20 years. Yes. <laughs> Love it. Excellent. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Michael, and you're on mute. Got it. No. So, Michael Hartman, uh, I have probably been doing marketing us long enough that I'm starting to see things come around full circle, I think, in some ways. So, uh, various leadership roles in marketing, ops, marketing tech web e-marketing all that i'm a uh, i started out as an engineer somehow i found my way to, to marketing so that's uh, an interesting thing but fun fact for me is i uh have been in a uh, flash mob dancing really? at an eloqua con conference believe it or not that's awesome <laughs> excellent thank you michael and sarah Hello, everybody. Glad to be here. I'm Sara, and I've been in marketing for all of, over 11 years. I think my background is a fun fact about me, honestly, because I started my career as a software engineer before moving to marketing. Now I use my tech background to develop B2B marketing strategies with a focus on automation, data compliance, and regulation, and privacy policies, and legal aspects. However, I believe that this unique mix really helps me to create effective marketing and compliant marketing strategies. But the other fun fact about me is I found and people find myself um, just as an 
noisy person, loud person most of the times. But deep down, I can't even listen to uh, any other music than calm, relaxing music and classic music. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thank you. Excellent. So um, I, I appreciate you all being here. So marketing ops ha plays a special role in, in the company, and it's a it's a, you know the keeper of the data and the keeper of um, I guess an important role as far as the, the security and compliance and all that. What what hey, are um, hey Bob? Not to cut you off, but we uh, we skipped Evan. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I oh, he's off the page. Thank you for that, Evan. Thank you. <laughs> all right, Evan. Thank you. Good job. I'm not actually a panelist. I just snuck uh -oh. in. <laughs> he hacked the system. Thank you. Found a, found a Zoom <laughs> link. Um, nice to meet everyone. I'm Evan, head of marketing at ServiceBell. Uh, been through a bunch of different data companies, B2B, SaaS companies. Very, very boring um, background, but started off uh, in linguistics and, and spoken word poetry. Uh, I actually almost went to nationals for the Seattle Poetry Slam team and failed so badly i forgot the middle half of my second poem um that you know just like i got like a one line write up afterward it was it was a rough day so that's my uh my fun fact but bounced back by going to b2b SaaS go to market which is obviously so much more fun <laughs> natural transition too natural <laughs> thank you evan and thank you mike for keeping me on track actually sure. so uh, do me a favor everybody if, um we, we can get this going uh, in the audience, if you can go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, enter the meeting number 6659-5952. Um, we'll be asking some poll questions. You'll be able to answer the polls there and um, and see the results real time. So that'll be kind of fun. Thanks to my, my friend, Sean Cook, who's in the audience for introducing me to the tool. Very cool. Um, so... You guys have a very important role at the company. What's what's what is how would you describe your your role as far as being the you know the key keeper of the uh, making sure the company's uh, doing what they're supposed to do, making sure it's not getting in trouble and that sort of thing. Thanks, Sarah. Who's going to jump like, on that grenade? Yeah, <laughs> she's got super super deep insights into that. Huh? I, I'm gonna I'm gonna popcorn you on that one. <laughs> Yeah, I think all the challenges. I can think about this one until yeah, tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> As someone that who is working in finance industry, where data security and legal compliance are quite important, I think that there are some key steps that nowadays I believe that all industries should take in and just take to ensure that they have the data accuracy and compliance steps and regulations in place. Uh, in my experience here at JP Morgan, I believe that we care about many things like understanding the AI specific regulations, because it's very more even uh, than other industries. It's important to understand and learn and keep up the keep ourselves updated uh, about uh, laws like GDPR, CCPA, and other um, upcoming rules uh, for AI generated data or uh, other things like uh, updating privacy policies for our data is a huge thing for us nowadays because we are going through every brand project. So uh, we are dealing with uh, data privacy policies, not only for our website, but also for our social media, for advertising, for campaigns, uh, for eBooks and events, and all of the other materials that can be used in any sort of ABM and ABX campaigns. Um, some other things that I'm really dealing with is a third party data and third party vendors, because it's really important to make sure that um, regular audits should be really in, con um, conducted to ensure our AI systems and all of our uh, vendors, like even Microsoft and Google, which are dealing with the uh, AI algorithms and technologies compile with, uh, com com comply with uh, privacy standards and uh, maintain data integrity. Um, I would say a huge part of my day <laughs> is just going through trainings because trainings matter. And I believe that it shouldn't be like only in the very big firms, but uh, I think that it should 
be in place for all SMBs as well to especially with coming more and with AI coming more in and integrating with more technologies that we as marketers are using and dealing with it on a daily basis. But employee training and data privacy is uh, something that uh, we took uh, actions for on a daily basis for all tools that we use. Uh, and it is like comprehensive data training programs uh, that we have in place to make sure that um, uh, in our in uh, the the AI driven vendors are compliant enough, so it's important really to believe um to build a culture of awareness and um, responsibility around the data um the AI usage um um and um AI tools that we are going to use. Uh, I can't speak about it for so many other things like <laughs> and, uh, transparent AI consent mechanisms that are really important, but I would like to hear others and insights as well. Excellent. Thank you. Actually, let me let me ask the first poll question and then we and then we can uh, keep talking after that. So the first poll question is, what excites you most about the potential of AI powered ABM? And this is a uh, a word response. So you can uh, put in, uh, three three separate uh, words or phrases, I guess, um, in response. And uh, we and we can keep talking as people are are, are filling that out. Um, any 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 other thoughts about uh, marketing ops? You know, key roles as far as being keeping the keeping the company straight and uh, going the right way and 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 again where where does the ai come in as far as making your life easier or more challenging i want to pick up a little bit of one of the things that uh, that sarah was just talking about that i think is um you know one of the unknown defined bases that I, that i shouldn't say unknown underrepresented defined spaces, and that is compliance in AI. And I think particularly in the US and North American centric market, there isn't the same degree of attention paid to those elements of compliance. And I, I, you know, I believe that as we see global standards emerge and a demand for more transparency, that there will probably be additional weight put into the marketing ops function where the choose your own adventure ecosystem of you know do you want your data handled and processed by machine learning or not will impact the user's experience and when we think about it in the context of abm and growth i think ensuring that that capability to remain compliant with a person's wishes while still delivering a marketing service to that community is going to be uh, a new universe that we have yet to really be emerge in how we manage that and, and how those experiences get delivered. So I just wanted to kind of pick up on that compliance question because I think it's an under, um, we're not paying enough attention in that space, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, Paul, I think I think what, what you were saying, something that I was thinking too, which is it feels like I have always thought of marketing ops is playing a key role of sort of, I don't know that they're competing things, but there's a tension there that on the one hand, you want to be an advocate for customers and their privacy and being compliant, all that kind of stuff. On the other hand, you want to enable the business to grow. And sometimes those, those two needs come into conflict and you have to choose your battles. And I think that puts you in a position of you need to be consultative. So you need to understand as much as you can about both the things that are externally affecting you as well as the internal needs. And that's a challenge. So that if you don't really fully understand the full life cycle, it's it's tough. Adding in AI and machine learning, I don't think changes that dynamic, but it makes it it's a new thing that we have to deal with, just like any other new technology. Right. I think I think just to I don't know, put a point of emphasis on that in agreement. Um the, it, I, I think, you know, it's a bit of an echo chamber perhaps here, <laughs> but uh, uh, I think we're best suited for, for doing that. Um, I think that the, the role of a marketing technologist or a marketing operations professional in general um, is such that you, you have to understand the ecosystem of uh, all of these pieces. I mean, you heard when, when Sarah introduced herself, the world of 
things that she has in front of her around, I mean, in a finance uh, area, obviously uh, the, the restrictions are even more abundant. Uh, but gosh, when you're talking about privacy and compliance and just facilitating go-to-market motions, understanding what the tools can do, now you have to understand how data is processed and can these tools impact our business. And I think having that unique lens of how a business, the, the pulse of a business's go-to-market effort, right? You understand that in a marketing ops role, or at least you're, you're supposed to. Um, <laughs> and then you're supposed to try to understand how to take those, those people that you're interacting with internally, the processes that you're orchestrating around, and then apply technology to enable them, right? And uh, this, this new era of ABM and AI and, you know, can, I think we're the best suited to be able to go tackle that. Um, and I, and I really just, when I say point of emphasis, it's, it's literally because like, that's the conversation I have with like Paul and Michael and everybody here all the time. <laughs> so, um, well, the good news yeah. is because of AI, we'll all be able to go to the beach more because AI <laughs> will just automate all of this concerning difficult obviously. stuff that we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Obviously. I, on that automation idea, I am curious if anyone knows of any technology coming on the market that's specific to making this more operationally unified, right? Like when you think about vendor selection, right? Uh, it doesn't have the right security uh, protocols in place, should be like something AI tells you, right? Uh, and when you deploy it, right? Does it does an AI suggestion to your legal counsel for, hey, you need to add this company's relevant um, processing uh, you know, I could just see a lot of opportunities here for AI to help us govern the very tech stack that becomes more and more problematic as AI comes into the loop. Um, and I think we're going to need a lot more transparency from especially smaller vendors on in terms of how they um, process the data. But it seems like an interesting opportunity for new founders to think about, you know, AI assistance for t the technology stack on the on the marketing and sales side. Boy, Paul, that sounds super familiar, huh? <laughs> <laughs> we just did a whole deep dive when on you're, this. When you're talking about ago. echo chamber, you're 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 not lying. <laughs> I'm not lying at all. I haven't spoken to Evan in months. <laughs> like this is the point I'm making. We're all thinking the same things. It's fascinating. I don't know if anyone no, wants to answer that I mean, question though, Evan. <laughs> yeah, like that 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 is core to where I see the biggest gap today. So the conversations I'm having with customers and uh, are about two key elements. One is how do I get my data ready to be consumed by a, lear, a large language model and then make it useful? What data do I keep in? What data do I dump? But the other is how do I ascertain where vendors are getting their data from? What, how they're processing it? What do I need to be aware of? How do I assess them? You see vendors like Qualified, Zoom Info, Sixth Sense, coming up with these amazing new capabilities and it's black box mystery what's actually going on in the scenes and happening with the data that you're handing these systems and you need to start looking from not only the technology lens but the legal lens what new language is going into the elas and the the agreements that we're signing with the zoom infos and the six senses about how they're going to use the data you're giving to them to, that they use the process to feed data back to you. So this whole ecosystem of data as fuel and oil being consumed and handed into systems and then processed and brought back to deliver wonderful new experiences for sales reps and marketers. I think there's a lack of a, a language and an appreciation for what all that looks like and how vendors should be assessed and all of that, all of that soup. And again, we become the experts in this space, not only from a data operations technology lens, but from a vendor protection, understanding assessment and analysis lens. I would like to take a step back here and speak about if we are allowed to share the personal information data with the vendors, because in health industry or in finance industry, data share, data sharing is such a huge challenge. Because and they're all um all is because of not having transparent um legal documents there that speaks about how they are, the vendors are using the data, as you mentioned. 
So this is this is a huge challenge. And this is going to be a huge challenge because it's a totally black box. It's like we are dealing with treatment consents. We are dealing with cookies, but there is no lifespan for cookies. How For how long does this, and do these vendors keep the information and um, how are they going, going to use the personal information from our clients? So it is a very much um, appreciated that we are having these new tools. It is a very much delightful to use all of these technologies um, to just smooth and um, absolutely leverage our ecosystem just uh, and marketing technologies as a big picture. But still, it is important to understand how and when and what are the possibilities of data sharing and what we should do with uh, our customers' trust then. I'm going to bring up, uh, uh, I've got a question from the audience. Sean Cook, uh, I'm going to promote him up to ask his question. If he's, uh, see if this works. There we go. Hey, Sean. Hi there. Hi, everyone. Sean Cook. Um, my question was just, the. I guess everyone benefits when the data is anonymized. So I'm curious if when it's anonymized, even in healthcare, um, does that not, usually uh, the, the data processing agreements that I've seen have been all like, well, it's anonymous data. It's going to help everybody to be able to utilize that anonymous data. But I'm curious if that's not a solution, I guess, to to, to that it's it's a partial factor so i think in the in the land of anonymized data the the element that i think is still to be fully vetted is if from a compliance standpoint apart from being healthcare finance from a co compliance standpoint if there's legislation that says in kind of the similar fashion to right to be forgotten. Someone has the right to say whether or not their data is used in processing at all. How far does that extend? Even anonymized, we might need to have to, you know, we, we may need to extract an individual's data if they have requested that their data not be processed in that way. So it's the whole infrastructure surrounding this capability that comes to mind for me. I'm not minimizing the anonymized or not factor, but the the ownership of that data and how that data is leveraged, I think, is a key element that has yet to be fully um, synthesized into these conversations. Gotcha. And then, of course, if it's used <laughs> in extended circumstances, like where, where do the controls end, right? Like, well, are you going to sell that to someone else who's going to use it yeah. against me for something else, right? Yeah. So I could I could totally see that. But yeah. That was that was fine. I, I, I think it's interesting because, Sean, I thought, I was thinking of it in a different context. I was thinking like if you're collecting anonymous data, web traffic or whatever, how, you know, I think it's still like, there's still a challenge there because I think I've heard of some companies who are out there developing technology to try to stitch together profiles of these anonymous visitors, which is I think a little different than what you're talking, what Paul was talking about, which is you have data that's uh, identifiable and you pull out certain pieces of it that's not identifiable, hopefully. But in both cases, I suspect, right, there, it, there's going to be, these systems are going to get to be so smart about and have so much access to different data that there might be ways that they could stitch together and have a pretty high probability of matching stuff to a known person. So I, I don't think it's going to go away. Um, it, you could go all the way down to like a rabbit hole of like social engineering yeah. and how people get access to stuff and things like that. But Oh, that's a yeah. show me all the people who had jury duty who caught the train between. <laughs> so I yeah. Got it. yeah. <laughs> All right. Something that uh, I think that it matters here, specifically when we are speaking about ABM, is how we are allocating our budget and resources. So if we are not allowed to use personal personal information and personal data, uh, and integrate when while integrating with the other systems. Uh, what we are losing here is and um, we are spending our budget for to target our current customers. And this is not very ideal because we want to just use our budgets in a smart way. Uh, and the other thing is we might lose the opportunity for upscaling with a better customer experience, especially when it comes to 
uh, ABM, which is a huge point there, because if we are targeting our clients with the same resources and uh, with no really, really customized and tailored touch points, um, we are losing our opportunity for upsells here. So this um, is the main concern about not share, not being able to share the personal information data and integrate and just not having the fully integrated systems. All right, thank you guys. I'm uh, Sean. I'm gonna move you back back to uh, the audience. Thank you. Um, so let me just see if I can do a uh, show the results of the poll. Let's see. So these are the most exciting things that people are seeing about AI powered ABM um, relative size. Not sharing. Oh, it's not. Are you are you able to see it on on your Menti site? We can see it on the Menti site. Oh, but I can share it on my screen too. I'll do Whatever that. you want. I'll do that too. Share screen. Share screen. And uh, there we go. Okay. So deep data, uh, multi touch attribution, ability to scale, uh, count research, patterns, um, more patterns. Uh, anybody want to speak about? their what specifically about what they're finding most interesting and this can be for the audience or for the panelists what are our definitions of deep data i would love to drill into yeah. that yeah i was i was i mean obviously it's front and center but i was thinking the same thing what does deep data mean anybody want to anybody comment want to comment about why you chose that so i i was one of the people who voted for that but it, like i I know I think Paul and I have talked about this before, Mike, you and I have as well, but I I personally believe that uh, although there's been a lot of focus on AI enabling content, uh, which I think is still viable, I think there's still, when you get to the, the, the potential risks of exposing your proprietary content or data through these public forums, right? I think there's some, there'll be more and more resistance, but I do think that uh, it's easier to go with a sort of a private version of an AI machine learning you know, thing with just a bunch of data and let the engine look for patterns kind of deep, deep within the data that otherwise today you would have to throw, you know, multiple data scientists out there testing lots of different hypotheses, which would take a lot of time and probably miss patterns that you might not have guessed at having significance. I don't think it eliminates the need for people still to evaluate the results because some of those you know, some of those patterns that you see that might affect, say, an outcome that you want, a deal or something like that, uh, you can go like, well, I can't really do anything with that. It's not going to be actionable. So, but I do, but I think that to me, I think that's that I, I actually am more bullish about data and insights coming out of this sooner than some of the really extended content type things. Uh, so Matt, yeah, go ahead. Mike. I was just, I was just gonna say I I agree with that um, now understanding what you're what you're talking about there and I feel like we have talked about this before too um, years ago there was a company uh, known as Compellin um, I'm fairly certain they got acquired but the um, they're here in Orange County California actually um, their proprietary sort of model uh, this was before AI was on the tips of everybody's tongue um, and what they showed me was they could ingest a data set and you could say my my expected or desired outcome is that I get a, uh, let's just speak in B2B terms, like a closed one deal, a customer. And uh, and it would analyze the data and say, here are, here are the parts along out of the set that you gave me. Here are the things that seem to be most weighted to impacting the outcome of, of that that goal that you gave me. And it was absolutely mind blowing to watch it go through and do that in a matter of, you know, 15 minutes is what it is, what it was able to do. It took a team of eight data scientists previous to that more than eight weeks to be able to get to the same answers. And, you know, I don't know whatever ended up coming of them, but I reference that company all the time um, because to your point, Hartman, I think, I think that kind of insight while some of it, some of those, some of those weighted elements that impact that journey to creating a customer may not actually be that actionable to your point. 
um, there are going to be elements of it where, oh, wow, if we can, you know, reduce the time it takes a lead to reach a salesperson by this amount or get it closer to this average because the system just made it very clear that anyone who came in on a Tuesday, you know, or whatever, right, that's, that's incredibly actionable. You, you, you can go to town on that as a marketing ops technologist, right? Like all day long. So I, I'm, I'm bullish with you on that. I think it's super exciting. Um, the intentionality of getting some sort of system built for that purpose though, is, is sort of what needs to happen, right? At, that product doesn't, I don't think exist anymore. So, um, or they did, and it's just a different name now or something. Anyway, it's exciting. So it sounds like when you guys are talking deep, we started with deep data, we got into uh, seeing patterns and then, and then the actionable is kind of a key part of it all. So, so being able to use the data for actionable, um, seeing the patterns, making actions, uh, that's, that's what, it, that was a key point. So that, that hit a lot of the, a lot of the keywords that people were mentioning. So thank you for that. I also yeah. want to add on that, uh, you know, the multi-touch attribution is the one I mentioned. I think we're, we're delving into that territory to an extent, right? Uh, I used to be a head of a product for uh, AI analytics way before it was cool. So the company failed, uh, <laughs> but it was for TV and media. And basically what we were doing is we were, we built 30 proprietary algorithms to parse like the television content. So we sat down with HBO and said, here's why season two of True Detective failed. And um, uh, it was all this stuff, some actionable, some not, right? Like who was on screen, Vince Vaughn on screen correlated with a drop in viewership more than any other factor. And it's this loose correlation capability that you're right, my AI does bring uniquely to the table. And the closest analog in our space has been marketing mix modeling, but B2B data sets on the actual like marketing touch points have been so tiny, except in Sarah's case, most likely <laughs> that uh, there has been nothing to action out of like, all your advertising spend, right? Correlated to, to revenue. And most of our touch points that we work with are some sort of joint sales and marketing, like going between the two. So we need, yeah, we need exactly what you're describing. Like it scans the entire CRM. The beauty of this approach to then is it, it skips over the problem of data quality. It just says, is there a correlation by these things? These also suggestions on which fields are likely linked together or maybe should be merged because you have too many CRM fields, everyone does, right? And kind of serving up this like, you know, concierge for, for uh, look, we're not, we're not the experts here, but it looks like this stuff is linked, you know, out of 300 closed one deals last year, a hundred of them had, had these same three things going on. So that, that'd be huge. Like I, I would buy that today, you know? Compelling oh, I, for, I, for one, would definitely be happy if I was never, ever asked again to help figure out attribution reporting for marketing. So <laughs> yeah, if, plus, if there's nothing that AI can do, like NVIDIA can, can soar and the whole world can just come to a grinding halt because some marketer is going, tell me the attribution for this event. Like if we can solve that, that's the greatest thing that will come from this whole adventure, not having to try to engage in another attribution conversation ever again. Pretty great. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, it makes me wonder, is, would that whole concept of marketing attribution sort of go away, right? We'd have to come up with some different term. And it's, I mean, it's more like economic analysis than it is like to, we- No, the like, term exists, the most... Michael, it exists. The term is voodoo. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. Magic. <laughs> I think you've been. I think you've been down in New, in New Orleans too much lately, Paul. Let's do. Let, we'll just call it AI attribution instead of marketing attribution. All right. I think then the question would be: How do we actually formulate strategic shifts in coordination with the insights, right? Which is all what we've been wanting to been to be doing, rather than build reports. Yeah. Yeah, I I do think that. Um. I, I still worry, you know, and I guess it sort of gets to the next mix menti question that's up there actually. Um, and I do worry about the idea of being, being able to actually successfully skip over the problem of data quality. Um, Cause I think to a degree you, you can sort of give it to a system and just like, Hey, help me understand correlations here. But in the event that the inputs just like on the way in were just, just totally foobar, um, right? 
then it's still it, there's still this preceding thing where um you're not normalizing it maybe there's you know just you know i don't know typos and fields so that the data doesn't even get considered you know i i still think that there's elements of data quality that can still impact the outcome um and and you know i guess ai is just super super smart it'll be like oh i see that was a typo so i, I adjusted it <laughs> you know uh, there, there are there are people but, doing work around this and one of the most interesting conversations i've had recently was about ingesting hr data so taking data out of workday for people coming and going in different roles and looking at data sets in crm and marketing automation to say well how come we're seeing all of a sudden a change in opportunity stage progression well, you have a new VP of sales who just joined the company. And so seeing correlations in different data sets across a whole enterprise, you can start having different impacts on what we consider to be data quality issues, where it could just be organizational transformation happening at different paces in different parts of the business. Yeah. Isn't just that just to jump in real quick. So uh, Mike alluded to, it. we've got another poll up about um, if you can, if you can name some of your biggest challenges or biggest fears about uh, what AI is bringing or, or will bring. Um, and, and again, we'll, we'll keep talking, but if you can fill that out on Minty, we'll go back to that. Sorry, carry on guys. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. Um, I think that's super interesting, right? This, the, the sort of related, but, but, you know, often disconnected data sets um, that is, like imagine you know we talked about this idea earlier in the conversation we were just talking about the idea of sort of you know evan you, you brought it up right uh, adding to your tech stack and signaling that we needed to now go update our legal terms because we just added the way that this data is processed or, or whatever right like this sort of like orchestration guidance tool that helps you maybe um fulfill on on ensuring that you're compliant and updating all of these things but gosh, wouldn't it be interesting if you like dropped in a piece of technology and you said, or or you dropped in a thing that said, hey, we're about to make a new hire and as a CMO, <laughs> you know, and 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 this tool goes, watch out. Like, yeah, you're you're <laughs> talk about personal data. What if the personal data for the CMO is tied back to like, yeah, at every organization that CMO has been in, there's been a change in tech stack. And so you're going to spend the next nine months switching out your tools. You might not want to hire them. Ooh, that would be scary. Sorry. Anyway, I do think that that's super interesting. <laughs> and it's not just CMOs, right? We all do it. No, I mean, I, so this, this I, I think so this is a good I think reminder that this technology will enable us to do things that we probably never would have thought of doing, like merging those kinds of data together. And I think again, kind of go back to the role of marketing ops or revenue ops, whatever. One of our roles is going to need to be like really looking at these things with a little different lens and going like, just because we can do that, doesn't mean we should do that. Or even like, like I don't know, like. Because I think I think those are risks. I mean, I, I, unfortunately, I think we need to be thinking about these not only as like what's the impact for us as a, as this business, but what happens if this makes its way outside of the business? You know, to your point, Mike, if we if we were to track follow somebody and their impacts on organizations just, and what they did, right? I mean, I'm not sure that I'd want that. Like, and it, you know, it's not a stretch. Like, no, not really, at all. It's not a stretch to say I can follow. Uh, yeah, I could I could anonymize it enough to identify a persona category and say, hey, on average, when senior leaders enter companies in this category, this is what your expected, you know, changes will be and the impact of the business. Like, it, it, it's not hard to query a website, look at what pixels are firing and figure out what jobs they're hiring for and what roles and problems they have because on the job description it says that they have pardot now and it used to be you know marketo <laughs> and and they're like oh look i tie that back to this job change yeah that's uh that's super interesting so that that kind of stuff on the on the concept of abm and things that could be really scary <laughs> that uh that is that terrifies me a little bit um like 
I don't know. I don't know what to think of, of what could happen. And, and right, Hartman, like, just because we can doesn't mean that we should. Right. Um, no. anyway. And I can think about um, the user their trust and transparency because really my um, customers might distrust the AI generated and generated interactions. It is not like, oh, oh, we put it there and everybody trusts it and start using our chatbots for their inquiries. I think here, absolutely, we need a transparent, we need to be transparent about uh, AI and the technologies that we are using and provide options for all human interactions because um, not everyone is happy to be uh, tracked <laughs> and not everyone have, uh, is happy just to storage their data information for lifetime in our databases. But still, I think there are um, the, uh, there are solutions like having clear um, policy and data policies there in uh, for our users and to make it easier for them to engage. But I would say in one of the main things that I'm seeing as a highlight these days uh, that is coming up a lot is uh, with the AI is the crisis management because it is a huge challenge. It is a huge challenge. AI generated content could easily lead to PR issues. And in um, this part, which PR means a lot to many companies, uh, we should have a crisis plan management there. And I would say using tools like BrandWatch can help us to monitor our brand mentions and just sentiment analysis. I understand that, but we should set up the alerts for negative mentions to be ready and to address the issues immediately. Because if there is a certain, um, an, uh, there is an anomaly, anomaly there, uh, we as marketers, we should be aware to set up a plan in terms of um, taking care of our clients or the new users that are visiting our website and looking for our solutions, searching for our solutions, because as all, I think all of us agreed, um, there is no such like one line linear attribution there that people search for something or see something on LinkedIn and then just tend to lead and close the opportunity ASAP. So we need to think about uh, some crisis management here or the misinformation that are shared with, um, the, in, with customers because absolutely AI can product and spread the false information here. Okay. No, I don't want to poo-poo all over AI, but because you know, it is while it's scary, it is it is actually kind of exciting. But this is a this is we're in the segment of the show called "Let's All Be Terrified of AI." <laughs> no, but so, I mean, I was, I was just looking at the poll results, and and it, like I think there's a couple of them that get to the concern about you know the not knowing what's like how the black box works. Right? Mm -hmm. Did I lose you? No, I'm here. That was it. That was it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, it looked like maybe I lost connection or something. Sorry. Hey, everybody. <laughs> well, looking at looking at the fears people have. Uh, uh, anything surprising? Anything interesting to you guys? No. I. You know, in our category, can I just like be? be the glass half full guy that says I'm not actually that worried about more layoffs, at least for our particular sector. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I just don't, I don't know. I just don't, I think there will be a wave of, oh, we think we can do this without people because there's AI. And then they're like, oh, wait, no one knows how any of this S works. Um, do you, and therefore do you think there could be that. organizational transformation though that rides this where it might not be layoffs but we might leave being within marketing and move to being within go-to-market systems or it or some other part the of change, change in, changes in rules changes in the mix yeah yeah well, I, think, I, think I, I think i i think i think i think there's there may be the short term may be more layoffs but that's because the required skills are going to be you need to be able to understand like how many, I guess there are now jobs for people who do prompts for, you know, ChatGPT and whatnot. 
No, so I think the, the point is, right, there's going to be a shift in what skills and exper experience are going to be needed, even maybe within marketing operations, right? So if that's a yeah, part of it, so will there be layoffs or change? Like there will be, there will be people who will be affected. I don't know exactly what that will look like. Some may be layoffs, some may be layoffs, but we're hiring a different person and maybe, or maybe you're currently have this, and we, you need to do this. And so you need to get some training and education and experience. Uh, yeah. So it's hard uh, to say. Yeah, short time is most likely and exci being exci getting excited about all of the tools that are there or oh, look at the new tools or oh, look at the new video generators or anything like this. But I think for longer term visions, we all need to incorporate learnings and just scale up ourselves because the next wave will be, can you use these technologies in SMBs or either? big firms and to just transform the business model from having none and just using AI to do your uh, manual repetitive work and moving to the next level by uh, just enhancing the technologies and enhancing the strategies that we are going to develop. One of the things I do wonder about in the layoffs type category is the entry points into our professions are going to change because the notion of being an intern or being a, a, a specialist level, I think a lot of the work within marketing technology operations that people enter through, that is the layer that I imagine AI and machine learning is really going to impact first. So, you know, the the idea of being the person who scrubs and imports data or, you know, these, uh, these conduits into professions, not only in marketing ops, but in sales ops, in, in any of those areas, I think that you'll need to have a higher degree of technical competency to land in these spaces than used to exist where you can develop skills and, and start from scrubbing Excel spreadsheets and CSV files to make sure that they can be imported. Then there'll be intern opportunities for that specific space. That's right. Yeah. So people start from that level. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's, I think that's absolutely right. I, my, my sister just graduated. She's, she's a bit younger than I am. And, uh, I am doing exactly that, right? Like I'm saying, Hey, if you want to learn about this field of marketing automation and marketing operations, um, here's a task, let's build out a nurture series and yeah, go for it. Like use GPT, figure it out, right? Here's some data inputs, feed it some info. And so she's totally taking those steps, right? But I could see us as leaders and managers of people building out sort of like a step-by-step -step process, the same way we used to do a step-by-step -step process for data imports or, you know, how to build an email template or whatever. Um, you're just going to have a series of, you know, prompts and step-by-step -step processes. And then the, 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 I think what's unique about it, though, is it actually opens up the opportunity to um, look at the results on the other side. And, and sort of validate like, oh, did it, did it produce what I wanted to? And then what was the ultimate outcome? And it, it, it almost like skip stages to the, to the part of now you're learning and interpreting the results of your behavior versus like just plugging away, trying to do the task, which I think so that's kind we'll of all be at the beach more because we'll have <laughs> all of this spare time. So, so, but here's, here's the challenge. And I've got, you know, living this, I've got one in college, one in high school, one about to be in high school. And I see what they're learning, which is, doesn't look all that much different than I learned when I was their age decades ago. Right? <laughs> um, and 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 so I'm encouraging them, especially the one who's in college who has a little more flexibility, like start learning how to do data analysis because the downside, like here's what I've found is that people coming out of college or young people, even some seasoned people don't really know how to, interpret the output of an analysis of data. And I think that you, you're, you're right in that that's going to be something they'll be able to do. But if they don't know how to do that, that's going to be really, really hard. So if you don't have a basis for how to understand data, how to, how to understand statistics, you know, that's going to be a really hard thing to do. And that's like, so that's the kind of stuff, right? Talk about layoffs, right? So if you're just focused on technology and how do I generate you know, 
email content, web content, et cetera, et cetera, and you're not able to then interpret data, I think you're actually going to be behind others who can. I think it doesn't matter think, what, what degree or what area they go into either. It's it's, nope. it's all, all across and, the board. And I think that's the kind of distinctions we need to make, Michael, that you're right about. Like, the, I posted about this yesterday, but there's some big differences between uh, B2C and B2B, and then even within B2B where I am, uh, big distinctions we need to make just briefly here. One, B2C has had pretty cut and dry playbooks, especially on the e-commerce e side, to the point where people are creating spoof, spam, fake e-commerce companies that are stealing dollars and not sending products. And, and they just proliferate, right? They replicate the site, they replicate the Instagram ad, the TikTok ad. That's proof that that's, that's a race to the bottom on capability of the AI. Yeah, I can just totally take over end to end. You could have an AI, create a website, make an ad, run the ad, right? Like it'll be on the advertisers to try to platforms to try to slow them down. On B2B, we've seen over the last couple of years, like no one knows the cut and dry playbook, right? Like how do you get success creating pipeline driving revenue when you're not already a massive incumbent in B2B is, is not something AI can go and copy yet, right? Uh, email is getting destroyed on deliverability and, and all that kind of stuff. Phone, you can't even call with AI legally in the United States. Like, so I think where we're protected I think, Mike you, Rizzo, you do have a point. I think that, that we are very protected in the sense that uh, we are still the, and, and this is where a data analysis comes in, we're still the experimentation leads, right, for how do we grow at scale. Uh, and, and AI can't replicate that until we know how to replicate that, and then we'll totally get replaced. But I'm not sure when B2B SaaS GTM, for instance, is going to be clear cut maybe two years, maybe. Mm. Uh, real, yeah. real quick uh, uh, poll question out there about what, what favorite uh, tool areas you are interested in or, or you appreciate out there in your in the audience. Uh, go ahead, guys. And then you know, we're a little short on time. I just want to get a few more things in. So sorry about that. For sure. I, I do take for granted the... Um, the foundational elements of like stats that I learned in, in my college education. I've mentioned this before on our show, Hartman on Opscast, right? Where I, I sort of forget that, like I learned that stuff. I'm not a statistical like expert or professional, but I have an understanding of correlation and, um, and uh, margins of error and, and all of the things, right? And so uh, I at least maybe can write the right query or get to a place where I can ask the right question of the data. Um, and that's not me tooting my horn. It's that I'm just realizing, oh, there's this foundational layer that I, I forget that I learned that not necessarily everyone is going to pick up. And therefore, it needs to be built into our education and training, as we talked about right at the beginning of all of this stuff where, you know, sorry, you, you said it's important to stay educated across the stack for compliance reasons and, and the like. But I think, you know, Hartman, to your to your comment about if you don't really understand how to interpret the data or whatever, I can't pretend like I can understand how to interpret all the data either, but I think it can be taught and it can be learned um, perhaps more rapidly because we just understand that that piece is so critical now to, to this sort of new era that we're in around um, AI and go to market that, you know, we just, we just prioritize that, that understanding, which may, you know, change this profession a little bit, right? Uh, it, it may weed people out um, because they're just not data nerds and they just don't want to do that. <laughs> um, and so in that regard, we might see sort of a shift or change of, you know, um, persona that enters this field. But, yeah, I mean, I, I've, see, I've seen a gap in that skill set already over the last couple of years when I've tried to hire for marketing analytics roles. This, is, I think, just accelerates it. Right, because mm -hmm. because the, the 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 risk there is if you don't know how to do that, you're going to trust, but not verify what comes out of this AI powered solution. Yep. Yeah, I'd agree. I just did a query. Uh, I, I I ran a, a fairly advanced uh, set of um, requests into GPT just two days ago to try to do a, build out a projection for our business on 
how how Mopsa Palooza might shape up this year, uh, based on sort of year over year performance, et cetera. And I, I will tell you that um, I was aware enough to 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 spot some anomalies in in the data set that I said, hey, 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 you you didn't factor this in. You know, these are the things that you're not thinking about. Um, and so it, you know, it took me an hour or two to go through it, but it definitely did a data analysis that would have taken data scientists weeks to go do. Um, and so I think, yeah, over trust is very risky um, when it comes to the to AI. If you don't. So what are the predictions, Mike? Are you willing to share? <laughs> I mean, so yeah, I mean, we're 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 more than double this time last year where we were, um, and so we might sell out this year and. Um, I just sort of had it extrapolate that sort of growth over the next handful of months to, uh, you know, we're a bootstrapped organization. So I was like, do I need right. to take another loan to be able to pay for this stuff? Or do I think there's going to be enough runway? I don't know. And so <laughs> it, I think it's okay. <laughs> At least the AI says it is. <laughs> so, I'm Trust trusting it. Verify. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll All let right. you know by the end of the year if we're bankrupt. <laughs> All right. I, by the way, I hate I hate I interrupt you guys um, um, this point, but we've got a few more minutes. Um, so the the last poll question was what you know what what tools are you interested in? Uh, data quality assurance was number one. Um, what is that to you guys? What what are, are there any name tools out there that are pretty cool? I personally use uh, tools like Tableau for data visualizations and. Absolutely. On a daily basis, we are using marketing automation tools like HubSpot, Salesforce, and Dynamics. Microsoft Dynamics uh, is a huge thing for us these days. I believe ChatGPT is not absolutely just part. It is an absolute part of everyone's life these days. But um, for brand protection, I love Brand Watch because that helps me just to be on top of everything. What you call um, it brand what? Yeah, brand watch is absolutely a nice one. For my personal uh, stuff, I use Mid Journey a lot for gener to generate uh, videos and um, mostly images. Um, but these are my tech stack mostly. Marketing automation, CRM, and also the data visualization tools. In terms of analytics, I love still to stick to Google Analytics because the Google Analytics. Google because Analytics yeah. I love Mixpanel, honestly, but I could trust the data in Mixpanel in the past easier with first party data and all of these contents. I think Google Analytics is more trustable. Mm. Wonderful. Anybody else? And anybody in the audience, if you want to um, chime in on what, what tools you're you're enjoying. I, I mean, our stack is uh, predominantly HubSpot, ChatGPT. I pay for it and I don't train their model. So I have the sort of like segmented one now, which I, I really like. Um, there's a particular GPT that is, uh, oh, I should have just looked up the name of it. It's like an analytics one. Um, so it's, it's purpose built for advanced analytics, which is what I used the other day for the thing I just mentioned. Um, and I actually use Descript, uh, for a lot of video content and editing. So, uh, I'll type it out for you so you can Thank go you. find it. Um, it is wonderful. <laughs> it is terrifying. It, it can record enough of my voice that it could just make me, me at any time by typing in a script if I want to. <laughs> It's not actually me talking. It just has my voice, um, but it's like really now even cool. right. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> actually, I'm not here. I'm taking <laughs> care of my kid. This is this is virtual Mike. Um, yeah, so that, that's sort of my stack. I, I will say I'm excited about some of the things that like Stack Moxie is doing. So I've been using their, their product for a while. Um, they're adding in more components of AI. Um, and it's, yeah, stack, stack box C. <laughs> um, oh, thank you. And yeah, so that's like validation of your tech stack and making sure it's doing exactly what you expect at every step of the journey across your CRM and map. So for those that are, you know, needing uh, some 
robots to validate the process that you built. It's a good one. I highly recommend that. Thank you. Anyone else want to share? I'm a big fan of clay.com uh, for their Clayjent, which is basically a GPT-4 hookup. I'm sorry, what did you call uh, it? You can type it in. It's called clay.com. Clay, Folks okay. have probably heard of it. It's, um, but thanks, Mike. Um, but I use it for account research and summarization. So I, um, I have it scan websites and look for whether they have a free trial or a demo and it returns like natural language output and I can reference that in my automated emails, which we're testing, um, a lot of stuff like that. But I think there's a big opportunity by referencing existing notes fields uh, to consolidate into like a single master note. And AI just kind of maintains that for reps so they can always reference like one field. Crazy idea. One field that says like the status of the account. I'm, I'm trying to kind of orchestrate that with our HubSpot, Service Bell, Clay stack that we've got. But I just think there's still more work that needs to be done to be able to really facilitate that in CRM. Mm, yeah, Mad Kudu does a little bit of that too, like with their, um, uh, I think it's like Copilot is what they built or something yeah. like that. It's really it cool. Is, it I is spent Copilot. Like, yeah, is it called mm -hmm. Copilot? Yeah. yeah. I spent a good like hour and a half with Sam at yeah. Adobe Summit and he was explaining it all to me. I was like, this is so cool. <laughs> I don't have a use for it yet, but yeah. <laughs> One more tool that I would absolutely recommend it is Clearbit. I think they're and they are improving still their data database, but um, I I would absolutely highly recommend their tools because they can enrich profile data and uh, cu customer profiles data uh, such as company site, industry, and even social media profiles only by having a business emails, which to me is an absolute magic because it, that means a smooth uh, user journey for form submissions and a higher conversion rate and uh, an easier <laughs> opportunity creation mm -hmm. uh, with least possible form, uh, form fields. I think they are very good. It's a good call out. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're a little bit over our time. What we can do if people want to stay, we can do an after hours chat. Um, I, there were some nice uh, uh, tools that were mentioned by some of the audience members. I don't know if you're familiar with those, but maybe we can get into talking about those. Um, if you can all stay, it would be good. I'm going to go ahead and sign off on this webinar now, and I'll I'll uh, I'm going to pause the recording and then let us let us keep talking if we want. But uh, any last um, words of wisdom from everybody? Yeah, sorry, I got, I I got to jump, unfortunately, but this was awesome. It was great to uh, to be on this panel and uh, great topic. Thank Likewise, you. Likewise, thanks for pulling yeah. us together, Thank Bob. You. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Uh, no, no final words of wisdom from me, but uh -huh. I appreciate y'all. And yeah, uh, follow Evan, follow Sarah, because it sounds like she knows what she's talking about. Man, that was awesome. Nice to meet you. Uh, Evan does a lot of great content, so be sure to follow him. Um, I keep trying to copy your tech stack, Evan, but you know. I don't have enough time in the day. <laughs> Excellent. Good job, everybody. It's a good talk. We'll have to do it again sometime. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.